to share with you what the Spirit of God has placed in my heart for you today. For when light stands next to darkness, light always wins. Be light. It's not a coincidence. The first time the universe hears the uttered words of God, it was not to say, let there be joy, peace, or even love. The voice of the sovereign, the divine, the glorious uttered the following. Genesis 1-3, let there be light. God always begins by turning the lights on. Life requires light. Faith requires light. To a great degree, metaphorically and prophetically speaking, we live in a Genesis 1-2 moment. And darkness prevailed upon the face of the deep. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't need to tell you. Turn on CNN, Fox, MSNBC, ABC, NBC, CBS, Univision, and even Telemundo. And you will discover that we are arguably speaking living in one of the darkest hours. Not only in American history, but in world history. Darkened by sin, immorality, moral relativism, spiritual apathy, cultural decadence, infanticide. Pornography, poverty, violence, pedophilia, false prophets, watered-down preaching, hypocrisy, unbridled consumerism, voyeurism, materialism, tyranny, terror, discord, bigotry, division, strife, injustice, hatred, jealousy, and unbelief. We are living in a very dark time, in a very dark moment, in a very dark season indeed. But listen carefully. You can accuse me of being Pollyanna-ish or uber-optimistic, but I do believe that we will not be defined by the darkness of a spiritual Genesis 1-2. We will be defined by the redemptive power of Genesis 1-3, let there be light. For in the midst of this darkness stems a prophetic truth, a revealed truth, an everlasting truth uttered by our Savior. Matthew chapter 5, verse 14 through 16, you are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men, that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Be light, for when light stands next to darkness, light always wins. It begins, if we exegete the passage in chronological order, be light by who you are. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. So we have to ask ourselves, who are we? It is the quintessential query stemming from the existential womb. Who are we? We cannot be light until we discover who we are. We cannot be light until we repudiate every single vestige of identity moratorium. There is an attack on identity. There is a multi-generational assault on identity. If darkness can convince us that our identity is fluid, defined by our circumstances, darkness will prevail. It is an issue of identity. So it behooves us to ask, who are we? Who are you? What defines you? Are you defined by your past? Are you defined by your circumstances? Are you defined by what others say about you? Here's the great news from what took place on the cross. Christ defines you. You are not defined by what surrounds you. You are defined by God's spirit inside of you. You are not defined by your circumstance. You are defined by his covenant. You are not defined by the hell you're going through. You're defined by the heaven you're going to. You are not defined by your failures. You are defined by his forgiveness. And for all of my Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, brothers and sisters, you are not defined by the likes of many. Like, 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 you are not defined by the likes of many. You are defined by the love of one. For all of my religious folk, you're not even defined by what you do for God. Get over yourself. You're defined by what God already did for you. The cross, the empty tomb, the upper room, his blood, his word. You are defined by the Father. You are defined by the Son, and you are defined by the Holy Spirit. You are defined by Galatians 2.20. My old self has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who lives, but Christ lives in me. That's what defines you. Be lied by who you are. 
And I know firsthand in my conversations at the highest levels of our federal government, I know firsthand that there is an attempt to define this collectively as an ecclesia, as a church. There are those that would love us to be an echo chamber of mutual affirmation that gathers on Sunday mornings and leave it to that. There are those that desire to label us and define us in such a way that we no longer have influence in the public sphere. So we must ask ourselves, who are we as Christ followers? Are we just another institution in society? Are we another religious faith narrative competing in the marketplace of ideas? Are we a feel-good apparatus for the spiritually impaired? Are we an antiquated conduit for a set of irrelevant values no longer applicable in the world of Netflix and Amazon Prime? How this generation responds will determine whether if once again light overcomes darkness. So who are we? We must respond with clarity, conviction, and courage the following. We are the light of the world. We are a city on a hill. We are people of the word. We are salt and light. We are prophetic and not pathetic. We are disciples, witnesses, and Christ followers. We are evangelists, pastors, and teachers. We are children of the cross, fruit of the empty tomb, and we are product of the upper room. We are the redeemed of the Lord. We are forgiven, free, and favored. We are called and chosen. We are the righteousness of God. We are world changers and history makers. Let me tell you what we are not with great due deference. We are not Google. We are not Microsoft. We are not Ford. We are not Apple. We are not the NFL and we're not even Starbucks. We are the church of Jesus Christ and the gates of hell shall not, cannot, and will not prevail against us. We are the bride of Christ indeed. So be light by who you are which means you are not first and foremost black, white, yellow, or brown, Hispanic, charismatic, or automatic. You are above all a born-again, blood-washed, spirit-empowered child of the living God. Be light. Be light by who you are, always remembering that God does not call the perfect. He calls the willing. He doesn't call the one that has it all. He calls upon those that are willing to surrender it all. Because every single time light stands next to darkness, light always wins. Be light by removing the obstacles. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and hide it under a bowl. In other words, if you have it, don't hide it. Let it shine. Our challenge is to remove the bowl of apathy, complacency, acquiescence, and fear. And once again lay claim to the stand of righteousness so that we may shine before all men. We cannot be lied until we embrace that reality. We cannot be lied until we come to the full understanding that today's complacency is tomorrow's captivity. There is no such thing as comfortable Christianity. You are what you tolerate. Truth must never be sacrificed on the altar of political, cultural, or sexual expediency. And while many are saying, this call to be light is a waste of time. Things will get darker. Christ is coming soon. I agree that Jesus is coming. But while we are waiting for Jesus to come down, Jesus is waiting for his church to stand up. Be light by removing the obstacles. What obstacles? It is a spiritual battle to turn off the light. Ladies and gentlemen, there is a battle to turn off your light. There is a battle to turn off my light. It is not primarily political. It is spiritual. Ephesians 6.12. We are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, against evil spirits in the heavenly places. What does this mean? Parenthetically and metaphorically speaking, the spirit of Jezebel still lives, prompting men and women who carry a mantle to hide in the cave of discouragement, fear, anxiety, and confusion. The spirit of Absalom in 2020 still lives, dividing homes, churches, communities, and relationships. The spirit of Nebuchadnezzar still lives, demanding that a generation that carries favor, even in the midst of a Babylonian captivity, bow to the lies of a false narrative that negates grace, truth, and love. The spirit of Herod still lives, 
killing the innocent in the womb and in the streets, murdering precious dreams and vision. Yet I have news for you. Let not your heart be troubled. There is a spirit more powerful than all these spirits combined. I am here to declare to you today that the most powerful spirit alive today upon the face of this planet is not the spirit of Pharaoh. It's not the spirit of Saul, Absalom, Jezebel, or Herod. It's not even the spirit of COVID-19. The most powerful spirit on the planet today is still the Holy Spirit of Almighty God, the spirit of the Lamb indeed. For it is not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord, Zechariah 4, 6. And where that spirit is present, there is freedom, 2 Corinthians 3, 17. There is power, Acts chapter 1, verse 8. What does this mean for you and I? It means lift up your head and rejoice. Because for every spirit and narrative that facilitates the platform for moral relativism, spiritual apathy, and ecclesiastical lukewarmness, there is a counter spirit more powerful. In other words, for every Pharaoh there rises up, there must be a Moses. For every Goliath, there must be a David. For every Nebuchadnezzar, there must be a Daniel. For every Jezebel, there must be an Elijah. For every Herod, there must be a Jesus. And for every devil that rises up against you, there is a mightier God that will rise up for you. It is time to remove the bowl. It is time to shake off whatever hell or life has placed upon your life. Always remembering that what you can't shake off, Jesus washes off. That you are here not because you perfectly held on to God, but you are here because God perfectly held on to you. Because what God has placed inside of you is greater than anything hell can place in front of you. You are here and alive today because you discovered the following truth. When life throws you rocks, you build an altar. 1 John 2, 8, I am writing you a new command. Its truth is seen in him and in you. Darkness is passing and the true light is already shining. Arise and shine for your light has come and the glory of God has risen upon you. Isaiah 60, verse 1, for when light stands next to darkness, light always wins. Be light by where you stand. Instead, they put it on the stand that it gives light to everyone in the house. The stand represents the facilitative platform on which we shine the light of Christ. And the question must be asked, where do we stand? We stand on the undeniable and unshakable reality that Christ is the hope of glory. We stand on the fact that there are not five ways, four ways, three ways, two ways to heaven. There's only one way to be saved one way for eternal life, one way for new life, one way for abundant life. And that way happens to have a name. And it's not just any name. It is the name above every other name. It is the name to whom which every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. It is the name that is a strong tire and the righteous run into that tower and there they are saved. It is the name of Jesus Christ. We stand on righteousness and justice. Psalm 89, 14. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Unfailing love and truth walk before you as attendants. We stand on a cross that is both vertical and horizontal. It is both heaven and earth. Righteousness and justice. Sanctification and service. Holiness and humility. Truth and love. Conviction and compassion. The prophetic and the practical. Missions and the marketplace. Orthodoxy and orthopraxies. John 3.16 and Matthew 25. It is the New Jerusalem and Dallas, Texas. It's time to stop breaking the cross. It's time to reconcile the vertical and the horizontal elements of this Christian message. We stand on the name of Jesus. I had the privilege some time ago, I have had the privilege of preaching, or better yet speaking, praying at the inauguration of President Donald J. Trump. I was invited. I remember when I received the invitation and my wife was with me in the car and we received the call and, and the call came in through our Bluetooth. And, Subsequently, our second call, when I was responding to the invitation, I actually took some time to pray about it for various reasons. Primarily, uh, I was concerned. My church is very multi-ethnically diverse. It's 40% white, 40% black, and 20% Latino and Asian. 
And the, the, the political discourse back then was very divisive, even more so now. But I was concerned about the long-term impact on my congregation. And I prayed about it, and the Spirit of God said, Samuel, you're doing this. So the second call came in, and when the person inviting me from the Senate Inaugural Committee invited me and said, uh, Pastor Rodriguez, you know, what say you? And I said, well, we're going to do it, but tell me, will you censor my words? They said, no. Do you, will you tell me what to say? No. Or will you give, they said no, and they continued to say, they actually interrupted me and said, Pastor Samuel Rodriguez, the reason we're inviting you is because we want you to share whatever the Spirit of God places in your heart to share. Wow. And that is why in January of 2017, before an audience of over 1 billion people, after a number of years where that name was not mentioned on that stage, on that setting, I lifted up the name of Jesus and prayed what I'm sharing with you now from Matthew chapter 5 and concluded by saying, I make this prayer in the name of Jesus. You all saw it. Many of y'all participated and saw what took place. The crowd responded, cheering and saying amen. Behind me, members of Congress, former presidents said amen. Across the world, I received text messages from friends and followers that said a loud amen. It was the first time in many years, in many years that that name was not mentioned on that stage. And I was asked, why did people respond in such a way to the mentioning of the name of Jesus? Because ladies and gentlemen, there is still power in the name of Jesus. There is still power in the name of Jesus. Be light by what you do. In the same way, let your light shine before men, that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Jesus changed the world because of who he was, what he said, and what he did. His character, his rhetoric, and his actions. Let us do likewise. Ephesians 5.8, you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light. We will shine when we understand that Christianity is less about promoting the perfect and more about blessing the broken. We illuminate our surroundings when we embrace the truth that our faith stands measured not by the level of rhetorical eloquence, but rather by the constant of loving actions. We push back darkness when we recognize that in and out of the womb, every single human being carries the image of God without exception. And we magnify the light when we realize that a divided church will never heal a broken nation, but a united church can change the world. Be light, be light, be light, be light. Not by bowing down to the agenda of the donkey or the elephant, but only bowing to the agenda of the lamb, which is the lion of the tribe of Judah. Be light when you fully recognize that Uncle Sam may be your uncle, but he will never be your heavenly father. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. 1 Corinthians 4.20. Be light by your actions. Our actions, reactions, and interactions should conform to the following outline. It takes conviction to repent, courage to speak truth, holiness to see God, faith to move mountains, and love to change the world. So when asked, what do Christians do besides going to church on Sunday? What do they do besides going to church on Sunday and whining about things Monday through Saturday? Here's my response to the reporter. We love we forgive, we bless our enemies, we walk in integrity, we quench the thirsty, we clothe the naked, we feed the hungry, we welcome the stranger, we take care of the orphan and the widow, we preach the word in and out of season, we worship in spirit and in truth, we do justice, we love mercy, we walk humbly before God, we are light. First Samuel 3, 3 says, the lamp of God has not gone out yet. I love it that the brightest light in the color spectrum is when all the lights come together. Let me remind you, there is no such thing as a black church, a white church, a yellow church, or a brown church. There's only one church, the church of Jesus. So be light, turn on the light, because every single time light stands next to darkness, light always wins. Be light and walk like Enoch. Be light and believe like Abraham. Be light and stretch like Moses. Be light and shout like Joshua. 
Be light and fight like Gideon. Be light and lead like Deborah. Be light and pray like Daniel. Be light and build like Nehemiah. Preach like Peter. Serve like Stephen. Be light and live like Jesus. Be light and change America. Be light and change the world. Because every single time light stands next to darkness, light always wins. So UK, get ready to change the world. Assemblies of the United Kingdom, let's get ready to change the world. Let's do this. Together, we will be light. Together, for the glory of the risen Christ, let's go change the world. We love you. God bless you.